when people talk about Leonardo da Vinci and when they talk about Jackson Pollock, they will also mention Jean-Michel Basquiat. When I first met him, just a few months short of 16, he was living on the street, staying with God knows who. The streets are so intimate. You could just sit on a bench and meet somebody. You could spend the whole day with you didn't even know who they were. We came up with this thing, same old, you know, this is the same old. Sam-O, S-A-M-O, come on, you've seen it on the walls. This gentleman right here is Sam-O. Sam -O was part of a conversation happening in New York. The city was burning down, literally. The murder rate was at its highest point ever. People were really angry at the establishment. The eruption of graffiti inspired a lot of younger artists to take control over that situation on their own terms. What Basquiat understood was the nature of public space. His work was a texture of the city around it. He was discovering his own art form. The walls and floor were his canvas. He was into letting art be itself, and that's why his work was very crude and childlike in some ways. The first time I saw his graffiti, I said to him, you know, you're going to be as big as Andy Warhol. At a certain point, John just took off, and you knew he was not coming back. John knew that he only had a limited amount of time. And I think that's what kept his wheels turning faster than everybody else. What an example of a true investigator of visual ideas, language, and music. Jean-Michel, with his work, had an effect on everybody that saw it. Brett De Palma. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, unlike my colleagues here, uh, Sarah and Brett, um, I did not know Jean Michel Basquiat as a friend. Um, I did have one somewhat unceremonious encounter with him, um, but I'll keep that discreet. Uh, I'll tell, tell you later. No, 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 no. Oh, do um, tell. <laughs> well, there was a room and a door and activity inside, and I went through to the door, and he closed it. <laughs> so, um, But um, I was, however, intimate with the city that shaped Basquiat and many other artists, some of whom are here tonight, a place and time that I believe was masterfully portrayed in Sarah's film. To quote Jennifer James, I think you gave a most vivid representation of that era. Um, so. Uh, this slide was taken on August 5th, 1980. Um, Ronald Reagan was visiting a vacant lot in Charlotte uh, Street in the Bronx, a lot that the policies of the Republican Party had a lot to do with creating. But you could see a scene like that all over the city, in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, and particularly in the Lower East Side. So in, in 1981, I was an art student at Pratt in Brooklyn. Um, you can insert your kid and play joke here. That's a high top fade. Um, I paid $125 a month rent for uh, a floor of a brownstone. Um, my last apartment in Brooklyn in 2006 was about 10 times as much, and it was not 10 times l larger, or, or the neighborhood wasn't 10 times cooler. Um, uh, while in art school, I knew two artists that were killed. Um, one, a friend Anne, was killed by the robbers in her apartment in Brooklyn. Another friend, the graffiti artist uh, Michael Stewart, was killed by the cops while doing what Keith Haring and Jean-Michel became famous for, tagging the walls of the city. But it was that danger and affordability of New York City that functioned as a magnet, drawing artists from all over the world and um, from every ethnic enclave of the city to lower Manhattan, to places like the Mud Club and Club 57, to launch cultural trends like hip hop that begat graffiti, 
and breakdancing and punk that begat New Wave. So now we get to meet two people who lived in that bombed out boom for real urban landscape that Basquiat used as a canvas to capture first the attention of his peers and then the art world and now, thanks to films like this, the whole world. This is Brett and his friend Jean-Michel. So Brett De Palma recently returned from Miami Art Basel where NADA, which is the new Art Dealers Alliance, hosted a booth for Brett and Scooter LaForge La 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 entitled um, Looking uh, Through the Looking Glass. Um, some of his recent one-person exhibitions include a 30-year um, retrospective at Howl Happening Gallery uh, in 2017, um, a one-person show at the Rockland Out Council for the Arts in Garnerville in 2016, and the Mothership um, Gallery in Woodstock in 2015, and Brett was uh, given the Rockland County Executive Visual Arts Award in 2013. Some of Sarah Driver's credits include um, co-writer and director, producer for You Are Not I in uh, 1982, Sleepwalk in 1986, Boom for Real, 2017, uh, director and story for When Pigs Fly in 1993. Really? <laughs> Pigs did fly. Uh, Stranger Than Paradise in 1984, producer and producer on Permanent Vacation 1979, co-producer on Uncle, Uncle Howard in 2016, and in development, Tales Told by the Hanging Head. For uh, children of all ages. There you go. <laughs> um, Sarah, just, uh, just a first question if I may. Um, uh, is not only a filmmaker, but you were also a member of the art scene that your film depicted. So my first question is, and if I'll have the same first question for Brett. Um, so in the early 80s, um, where did you live? And just to make everyone in the room moan, what was your rent? I lived at uh, 24 Prince Street between Mott and Elizabeth, across from Ray's Pizza. And pizza was 25 cents a slice, and our rent was $135 a month. Uh, <clears throat> we lived on 262 Mott Street between Houston and Prince across from the old St. Patrick's Cathedral where you could look into the graveyard where Martin Scorsese shot some of his film Mean Streets and um, we paid the exorbitant fee of $300 a month for a thousand foot loft that we had to, uh, that had no bathroom and no kitchen and we had to break through a brick wall into the public bathroom and annex one of the toilets for our bathroom. So. Good real estate move. So we were talking earlier about the streets. I mean, the streets are a character in this, in this play, uh, I mean, in, in your film. Um, what, what, was, what was it like in, in that time? And, and, uh... well. There was such a beauty to, because it was dangerous, you were very alert to everything on the street. So unlike everybody who's looking at their phones now and not really getting to see the dramas on the street, we were seeing everything. And you had to see everything. You had to, because it was so, it w was so dangerous. And I remember when I first met Jim, I had long hair. And I was going to NYU to get my master's degree on 7th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenues. And Jim cut my hair about an inch short so that I could look like a boy. And I could, then that way I could roam the streets at night and be, and I also took on like a mannerism, a more male mannerism so that I could, you know, be, protect myself on the street at night. And, um, um, but it, you know, everybody went to the clubs and it's so strange. We had fewer means of communication, but somehow we communicated with each other and put up, you know, posters about who, what clubs, what, what was happening, it was all, we'd run into each other in the street, it was all word of mouth of what was going on. It was a real community. Yeah, yeah I think the streets were, uh, again, kind of ugly and dirty and dangerous and that uh, you could turn a corner uh, off of Houston Street and see maybe a paraplegic who was out of his wheelchair lying on piles of cardboard so that you had to step over to get back into your door. Uh, the uh, John Gotti lived uh, one block away 
you would see him walk around old St. Patrick's Cathedral making his deals. Uh, the Bonanno family lived one block over on uh, Lafayette Street. There were social clubs in our building. Uh, I remember the first time uh, that an art dealer, or Anina Nose, who represented Jean-Michel uh, in the beginning, came to our building and she said, gee, I went into this uh, coffee shop on the second floor and these guys told me, uh, you can't get an espresso in here, lady. This ain't that kind of club. This is a private club. So that was inside the building, and then outside was, was a, once you walked outside the door, there was this cacophony of personalities and uh, people in a probably a 10-block radius who, who knew each other just from familiarity of running into each other and seeing each other in the clubs. And there was a very vital club scene at that time, which there isn't now. So that, that was a very different social um, milieu at that, at that time. And, and so someone like Jean-Michel came out of that fertile ground and really developed. You can see in this film his, his earliest uh, developmental forms where he evolved uh, into this person, this celebrity that, that he is now in... in uh, in a post a post mortem sense, and and it's and it's a little bit uh, depressing in that sense, and and so I I don't want people to take away the idea that this was a person who uh, didn't have hard times and and didn't struggle because there was a lot of and I think ambivalence in in his point of view as as I shared, and so there was this real kind of shared. Uh, sensibility about being in New York, which was very exciting at the time and very cheap. So, so, Sarah, how did you come to the project? Um, my friend Alexis Adler, who's in the film, uh, after Hurricane Sandy hit New York, um, the Lower East Side was flooded. And that was 2012, that was late October 2012. And I went, and we all knew she had lived with Jean because she had, she had this be beautiful mural um, of olive oil in her, in her bedroom. And um, she had a few of the collages, these collages around the apartment. Um, but she, she, she's one of the country's leading embryologists. She started the first fertility program with a doctor at NYU. And she's a scientist. And she was studying at Rockefeller University when she was living with Jean. And, um, and so I went over to her house to have a cup of tea and she went, Sarah, you can't believe what I remembered. And I was so, so really, I was so scared because it was in the flood zone on a in a bank vault under the sidewalk. And I went with my daughter Zoe and we found, I, I, I had totally forgotten, I put all this work away that Sean had left at my house. And it was over like 60, you know, drawings and, and uh, a notebook. And, um, and then she found like 150 photographs she had taken of him during this time. And, and I looked at them and a lot of them were in series. So I thought, oh great, I could animate these. Or, and then I, and I looked at everything she had and I, I just thought to myself, this is not only a window into him as a young developing artist, but also into the environment that helped develop him and helped develop all of us and helped form him as an artist. And I think it's so rare to, to to have the privilege and have witnessed a situation where you see how an art, what the, the environment where an artist sprang from, and to be able to convey that cinematically. I think it's important too to realize that in 1980, you know, when this film really was set, that when Ronald Reagan was elected as president, there was this. Uh, beginning of a split within the middle class that most of the artists that I met, including myself, it came out of the middle classes. I can't think of any artists who came out of a lower class background. Even Jean-Michel, the, the mythology that's kind of grown up around him is that you know he was this street urchin and that he, he came from uh, a, a place of poverty, but actually he came from a, an upper middle class family uh, whose father was an accountant, and uh, there was this split even within his family between his father and his mother, and that, you know, this kind of disparity in 
wealth or attention started to happen in 1980 when uh, deregulation started to happen and money started flowing from Europe into the US as opposed to the other direction. I worked at a, a blue chip gallery in Soho where I first started seeing uh, these same old, you know, writings on the wall and I thought, uh, this is some street philosopher or who is this person? And so he was already famous, you know, when I met him just because of his confrontation of the public in the streets where I think it belongs. So he, uh, he really had this sense of, of where to place himself within a context that, that made a lot of sense. Uh, and, and it was an assault. It was basically an assault upon uh, the upper classes and a kind of stodgy uh, academic uh, art world in, in Soho at that time that was calcified and the money had disappeared. And by 79, the gallery that I worked at said, we're gonna close because we're going bankrupt. Well, European artists started coming into New York too at that time. And so there was this exchange, not only with uptown uh, Manhattan but also and downtown, but also with a European flow of immigrants, who are artist immigrants. And, and I felt like I identified because uh, I was a refugee myself from, from the middle class, uh, suburban uh, upbringing, and there was this bohemia that was, I wanted to be part of, and that there were pockets of hip, hipdom that went you know, back to the beatniks. And so there was this tradition that I wanted to, to enjoy. Well, I think also we were multi-generational. I mean, you would go to like a club and there'd be William Burroughs or Allen Ginsberg, or you, know, you had the beats around, or you'd see Ornette Coleman on the street. You saw your heroes or, you know, uh, so th there was a, a, a kind of beauty in that as well. Um, and everything, you know, I kept the film restricted from 78 to 81. And because everything really changed after 81 and what you were talking about, suddenly money started coming in, suddenly the gentrification, suddenly there was crack, suddenly, um, you know, Ronald Reagan really changed everything. I mean, we have this government today because it started with him, essentially, and, um, and the deregulation. And I remember when he went to the Bronx and he had given money, the federal, the federal government had given money to the Bronx to put paintings in the windows of cats and curtains. And, and Reagan's going, look how I've cleaned yeah. up the South Bronx. Yeah. And everybody started screaming at him in the South Bronx and they had to push him back into his limousine um, to, to protect him. Um, so, you know, it really, it was sort of a very particular moment in time, those few years, I think, before the money and the ambition and other things, you know, kind of destroy the community that was being formed down there. And, and your decision, so we're kind of left with, we leave him kind of when he's on the launching pad, when he's just starting to catapult into orbit. Um, so how has the film been received? I, I think that you, you, when we, we spoke earlier, you said that there was a particular audience you were hoping to introduce him to when you made this film? Well. Um, I think it's great, you know, I, I, I think it's a good film for, for any age, but I really hope that like younger people see it and see the strength of community and how we all fed each other for, with inspirations and with ideas and exchanging ideas. I mean, we would just sit for hours hanging out and talking ideas or sitting at, um, what was the place, Benny Bomb. Benny Bomb. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. yeah, and just, you know, you'd sit there for hours, like just talking about ideas and just like, let's just pick up a camera and start shooting something. It was, and it was a very punk attitude. It was like everybody was in a band. Everybody was, even though you couldn't play any music or, you know, everybody was a painter. Everybody was trying to do everything. Everybody was a filmmaker. There weren't any, it wasn't so departmentalized. I feel like now things are, you know, you have to have one focus in this direction. Well, like film, that is the, that is the culmination of all the arts. That's, it, it, all the arts make a film so you know and, and I think there was such a beauty in that of this sort of exchange of people just willing to fail too I think there's a risk now people are afraid to fail or to and you learn from your mistakes so and that's how progress happens 
So I had a conversation like that today. I've been teaching uh, at the School of Visual Arts Young Artists for 30 years. And uh, one of the, they continually ask me, ask me these questions of, how, how, how do you become like Jean-Michel Basquiat? And, and what do I have to do? How do I get into a gallery? And I, and it's, I say, well, my beginnings, there was a lockout in the galleries that the, all the artists I met were either in bands because they couldn't get into galleries, and they, it was artists making art for artists. Right. And, it, and it really wasn't this kind of situation where I have to get into a gallery, I have to start making money, I have to succeed, or else uh, my parents are going to cut off my my allowance. And you know the the difference between the time here is is again. I think there was a point, and it was a moment that that lasted for just a few years, a couple of years. And uh, once the money kind of came in, I remember when Jean Michel said to me. Uh, Brett, you're going to have to start earning more money so we can hang out. And, and, and I, was, I was kind of offended when he said that. I, I said, Jean, I'm, I'm trying as hard as I can. And, and, uh, but, you know, it, it, it was some, he was telling the truth to me in a way, too, because this money that was dropped, it's like Malcolm X said, you know, when they start dropping that dollarism on your head, they can corrupt God. And, and he started to, in, this was 1982, they, he had so much money that he would leave piles of it on the table in his studio and he'd say, do you want some money? T take some money. You know, put, you, you need, what do you need? You want to buy a house? I said, yeah, I do, but not that way. And, you know, it, it was just this kind of rush that happened, and uh, it's hard to describe what that did to people. And again, this split that I think we're experiencing now in its fullest form of this unjust economy where, where people are, are either uh, in that stratosphere or you're down in, in a, on the bottom. And the difference back then was everybody was on the bottom. We were all bottom feeders in that sense. And, and I think that poverty kind of pushed us together in, in, in a community. The poverty and the fear. And the fear. And, and you know, the fear of not succeeding. Or, and so what do you do? You, 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 you create your own success. And I think Jean we was We did great. it for our, each other. You and I remember Fab Five Freddy yeah. telling, I was talking to him on the phone a couple months ago, and he said, Sarah, don't you remember? It, none of it was about money. It just wasn't about money, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, um, and, 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 and the funny thing about Jean, and I have a wonderful interview with Glenn O'Brien where he's talking about, Jean was never really that rich. He, you know, he was on an allowance by the, by the dealers. He was kind of controlled. He, he was never, he, you know, he didn't own a car. He didn't own a house. He had really nice clothes. He drank good wine. He went on nice vacations. But he, he Well, I think, I think the low rent is, in a way, or the low cost of living creates, you're on a tightrope, but the, the fall isn't too far. Because now the implications of not having money are more devastating. So, I mean, so I was talking to Mike Case, who's out here somewhere, and we were doing a project together, we had a little stumble, and he said, you learn more from your mistakes. And I, and I found that's true, because sometimes when something goes well, you're kind of be bewildered. Billy, talking to the mic, Billy. You, you're kind of be bewildered when you do something that goes well, you can't really figure out the alchemy of it, but when something goes wrong, you pretty much can figure it out. You're like, wow, you know, and I'm glad I did that, but I should have done that different. But now the implications of failure, I think, are a little bit more intense, and I, you know, I wish that I knew Jean-Michel more when he was in the band phase because I got to know him and of him when he was a rock star. So that became kind of the paradigm. Well, I want to be an artist like Keith Haring or like Jean-Michel Basquiat. And they were like living Picassos in, in, in the neighborhood. So it created a different dynamic. Um, I, speaking of speaking to the microphone, we have a microphone that we could share if, if anyone... Is, or is there a microphone in the... Uh, I'm going to take one of yours. <laughs>
or you can just shout out questions, you know, well, or, or, or ideas, you know, if you want to move it around. You know, one one interesting thing too about this period was was that there was this kind of um, ambivalence towards success and failure. So I think that Jean Michel kind of personified that ambivalence, and it got him into a lot of trouble. In, in sometimes because there was a point where when he did start making money and he realized what was happening to him, he started writing not for sale on his paintings or he, he would throw people out of his studio that, that he didn't like or that he thought was just there to, uh, to buy and, and take his paintings before they were even finished. So there was a feeding frenzy that he had to experience and go through. And, and also the, the, the idea that he had a kind of, uh, not a trance-like uh, stage, but he would go, he, what we call multitasking now, he could carry on multiple conversations amongst five or six people who were in his studio while listening to music, while watching television and painting. And you go, oh, he, it's a dance. He did, he made this, it was a marvel to watch him work because he could, he could, his attention was multi-focused and that allowed him, I think, to, to see things that most people didn't see and, and to codify it into his own learning. He, he really approached learning because he went to, you know, he dropped out of high school after he put a a pie of shaving cream in the principal's face. So he had this kind of trickster attitude and it was very slapstick and his sense of humor was really um, like that. But he went to City of School, which was a, an alternative high school where the type of learning that you have is not a structured curriculum, but you, you can choose through apprenticeships or, or, or focus your attention into an area of your interest that made a lot of difference for Jean because he was interested in many things at the same time. I think he got, I think um, the pie thing he got, remember Aaron Kay, the pie man? Yeah. He would pie, I think he pied Jimmy Carter. We're right. talking yippies. Yeah, that was a yippie move. Yippie, yippie, yuppie. You know, there, there's an evolution there. Also, uh, she would bring him to museums and things like that. I think she was very critical to opening his eyes to these possibilities, don't you think, Brett? Yeah, I think that's true. And, and she was Puerto Rican and his father was Haitian. And his father had this kind of example. There, there was some, I think, a kind of Oedipal thing going on there. But I think his father was this incredibly ambitious person who had... Uh, become very successful and was, was driving a Mercedes around and Jean ran away from home. There was a, con, a kind of confliction going on in the house, actually where his father, he claimed, stabbed him in the buttocks and, and he left the house forever until he made money and then he went back home the first time he told me, he said, I took a valise of money up to my father and, and, and I showed him my money and, and uh, he said, I... I said to him, do you love me now? And I, I thought, oh, oh, that's, that's pretty complex. And uh, I, I think that there was, uh, his mother was more of a nurturing, uh, as most mothers are, towards artists. They kind of understand artists in a way that fathers don't, I believe. And, and that his mother understood that uh, you can learn language because he was multilingual, Jean-Michel. He spoke fluent Spanish. He, uh, he didn't speak Creole, but uh, he certainly knew uh, a lot about uh, African culture. He, he was African Spanish, African French. So there was an interesting mix there. And he also was somebody who knew how to learn how to teach himself in, in, a, in a, an autodidact, a self-taught way, so that what his work was about was a lot about learning, the process of learning. And books and sources that he had around him, he was always not necessarily reading through the whole book, but he was picking and choosing uh, you know, things that, that caught his attention along the lines of history or... or uh, 
you know, how it applied to a contemporary situation that he found him in. So he, he spanned time. And, and I just, go ahead. I'm, I was just thinking also, you know, what amazed me that I learned making the film was he picked his own university. Yeah. He picked people like you, like mm -hmm. Luke Sant, like Jim, like different people who are, were in different, dealing with different kinds of mediums and, um, and really absorbed oh. information from them. Yeah. But it was, you know, and everybody was about four to six years older than him. I was 11 years older than Jean-Michel. And, and I, when I worked at, at this gallery, I was trying to, I wanted him to succeed. So I was giving him information about, well, troop movements. You know, this, these artists are going to this gallery. So he made very great moves in terms of his career and his profession. So he, he certainly had a street smarts about how, how to move. It was like a mushroom. I mean, he was yeah. absorbing everything yeah. around him. I really feel like this film was made by the, the downtown community. I mean, everybody, people either knew me or had heard of me, or, but they wanted a witness to tell this story. And they knew I was a witness. And so I really, I, I didn't have any money. I really had very little money to make this film. And the musicians, the music, I mean, it's extraordinary to have made a film like this and get the amount of music that I got. Um, basically by writing letters to people and appealing to them and uh, meeting with people and um, and so many people so graciously gave me material and when you're putting together a doc this took four years to make and when you put together you're sort of like a squirrel you're like gathering nuts you know you're gathering all the material and then you, you then it tells you how to make it I mean it's a fantastic thing you know it's like Oh, okay. It just it shows you how to do it and the process of doing it, and um, that's why I call everybody who gave me the archives my cl collaborators, mm -hmm. because I, I I couldn't have done it without the filmmakers, the painters, the the writers, everybody who who helped me make the film. It was another collab project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in a way it was. Yeah. I wanted to say too that Jean Michel had this instinct and a and a courage for putting himself in the place where he needed to be. It wasn't kind of chance, in a way, what happened to him, because uh, say, for instance, when he met Henry Gelzeller, Henry Gelzeller was the uh, head of the Department of Cultural Affairs in New York City, and he had brought with him a Swiss dealer, Bruno Bischofberger, who monetized Jean-Michel's work. Uh, I met him in, in Queens, at Long Island City, at New York New Wave Show, where we were both together, and Bruno Bischofberger brought, bought all of his work in one fell swoop because of Henry Gelzeller telling him that. Also, meeting Glenn O'Brien, who lived uh, two blocks away from Jean-Michel. Glenn O'Brien was the executive editor of Andy Warhol's Interview magazine at the time, too. So Jean knew this. He knew who people were, and he knew their importance and their pivotal uh, power to propel him. So he wasn't naive, and he didn't stumble into these situations. He placed himself in situations, and he showed up. Like, like people in the film said, he was ubiquitous. Wherever you went, oh, there's Jean-Michel. You know, he's here too. And, but he was, he was really energetic in his, his ability to spot uh, important people who could help him. And people were more than willing to help him because they, they saw what he was doing and everyone knew that he was going on. He was very charismatic. Very chari he was a charismatic genius, in my opinion. And, and genius not being this kind of rarefied thing because there were a lot of geniuses in downtown, downtown Manhattan, and geniuses who came from uptown to the downtown, and people like Fred Brathwaite, who were kind of uh, putting, mixing, remix. It was a remix uh, culture. So that, that was a lot of the key to Jean-Michel's success, was that he knew who people were, and he made it his business to know who people were. At that time, we didn't have any audio um, of Jean. So there wasn't really any audio available. Um, and when I talked to the editor, when I first was talking to the editor, I, I, I remember I said to him, I said, in this movie, Jean's a ghost. And I thought about memory and 
I don't remember often people's voices after their death. And I said, this movie, he's a ghost and the city of New York is a ghost. They're both ghosts now. And um, so it, it, it was a decision because I, there was no material. It's weird though about memory, about how you don't really, you remember people physically and you remember gestures and you remember those kind of things, but voice, for me anyway, I, I, I often don't rem remember people I dearly love, their voices. I think I'm getting it right, but the words ausencia, which is like a palpable absence, it's just the, the space is right. there, but the figure's gone. So well, there are actually after Warhol had that too. Warhol had that presence that was about an absence, like nobody's home. And it was so strong that you, you sense this pr presence. I, I think about another film that kind of picks up that I'm in, they're called Rage to Riches. I don't necessarily like that title because there is a class kind of presumption about that. But at, in, it opens where the interviewer is sitting across from Jean-Michel and he says, uh, it's been said there's a lot of anger in your work. Is that true? And Jean-Michel says, of course there is, of course. And, and the, the interviewer says, what are you so angry about? And for probably a minute and a half, Jean-Michel looks at the camera and says nothing. And, but he speaks volumes in saying nothing. It, he allows you quiet about him. something very quiet. He was a very quiet person. He was a, he was a sh it's strange, but he was kind of shy in a lot of ways. Very nice guy, charmer, elegant face, wonderful smile. He pulled you into his his universe because you wanted to be there but at the same time once you were there he kind of had looks that he used expressions to say a lot of what he was thinking and even Samo a lot of the the things he wrote on the wall were invitations for you as an audience member to self-examine to think about like at the, the way the film ends I think it's like when Felice says what can you do you know, this is what I'm doing. What can you do? What's been really nice with the reaction with the film is I've had a lot of people write me and say that they went back to work. You <laughs> wow. know, like they hadn't done their painting or their yeah. whatever, and they that after the film. So that was that that was a wonderful thing, gift. So we have two more questions: one here and then one in the back. Well, it was just an organic forming thing. I mean, I wasn't conscious. Race, the whole race situation was. It just wasn't. It was like uptown meeting downtown. We're all like influencing and inspiring each other and getting, you know, and hip hop was so at its early birth and um, we were all so excited about this new sound and you'd hear kids on the street with the boom boxes and, you know, and uh, you wanted to be part of it and um, it, it was just very organic. It wasn't conscious at all. No form of the whole downtown scene and the clubs, everything. It was all very kind of organically happening. And, um, and I think what's interesting about Jean-Michel's work, because of what's going on now and stuff, I think, and, and, and all the attention given to his work now, and it's so vibrant and relevant now, this is 30 years later, and he's still talking about police brutality. He's still, he's addressing things from 30 years ago, which are on the front pages of our newspapers now, you know, and I think that's kept him also so relevant. Um, there was a lot of a lot of racism, I think, that Jean Michel faced that I didn't face as a white man, and I can't put myself in his position. I mean, he would take the Concord at that time to Europe and come back to New York and couldn't get a cab on the street because the, the drivers just didn't want to pick up this young black guy. Uh, and I just want to say something about his work and the compositions of his work because people always ask me, why him? You know, why as an artist was he the one who's chosen? But there's something about his work where his backgrounds uh, and the figure ground relationship, he, he said to me, I've got to work on my backgrounds. The backgrounds are more important than the foregrounds. And, and what he did with his backgrounds is, is my theory is he's, He's kind of uh, not a patchwork quilt, uh, but he has that element of putting things together, constructing them, but then he deconstructs his background and explodes it. So you have fission 
and fusion going on simultaneously. So his paintings, his work kind of breathes. It's, his works are alive in that sense is that they're going in and out. Uh, uh, the energy that is in his paintings, you feel this visceral, uh, and everybody saw that in his work very early on, thought, this guy is different. I remember at New, at, at, uh, New York New Wave show, the, all the graffiti writers were given pieces, big pieces of metal to do their signatures on, and that's what they were doing. And, and we came in, so where's Jean-Michel? They said, oh, he came in, he freaked out all over his, his piece over here, and we don't know what he did but he wrote all of these things on, on there, and, and it was really a very different kind of way of working with language. He was a very language-oriented well, artist. That was another thing I discovered making the film, was he was a very advanced poet by the time he was 18 years old. Yeah. And when you look at his writings um, that in Alexis's archive, um, he was also very uh, precise how he put words on paper. You know, he'd have, sometimes have one word and one crossed out and then another word or, you know, but, and then leave the whole paper blank. I mean, he was, but his, he, was, he was an incredible, his use of words. And also, I think Michael Stewart, his death really affected John. Yeah. And there, yeah. it yeah. was, and the, and the whole taxi thing, I remember my friend Daryl Pigney, who was a black writer, you know, we had to go out and get him cabs because nobody would stop for him, you know. But, you know, part, part, of, the, um, part of the convergence uh, was that that was closer to the civil rights movement. And even though the civil rights movement was in a way decapitated by assassinations, there were still people who lived through this political arena of, of organizing. So in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, at the time when all this was happening, there was this thing called the People's Firehouse, where you know Koch wanted to close a firehouse, and the firehouses were the only way to stop the arson because all the landlords were burning down their buildings, and if you got rid of the fire departments, the fire trucks couldn't get there fast enough, so a whole block would burn down. So they said, we have to keep the firehouses open. So when the city came in and pulled out all the fire trucks, all the Polish residents rushed in, and when they started saying, we're gonna save our neighborhood, they obviously also wanted to save their neighbors who were from Puerto Rico, and the other families who were of different races. So there was a kind of political, you know, Melu, so that you have like the real estate show, that's an overtly political, you know, act, and it was reacted to by the city in, in, in the kind of a, an e, you know, equal measure because it was a risk. Sean Michel's one of his earliest ambitions was to be a fireman. <laughs> and I said, Why do you want to be a fireman? He goes, Well, I want to, uh, they save people. And Steve Buscemi was a fireman. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Steve Buscemi. And he's very political, Steve. Well, I, I tell my students, I, what I tell my students when they say, you know, my parents are really worried, this is costing a lot of money to go to art school, and, um, you know, they're waiting for me to be successful and start marketing my work. And I said, well, you know, I usually say, you may never market your work, but you know what you'll get out of this? You'll get a community that you could never get unless you went through this kind of environment where uh, creatives kind of recognize each other and support people, and you better be friends with, with other artists and other creative people because, uh, you know, that adage of who, you better be careful who you meet on the way up because you'll meet them on the way down too. And Jean-Michel was on, before his death, he really had a fall, a, a, a pretty high fall, and, and it really, uh, he was not able to recover from that fall. But it was the artists around who, uh, who support other artists because there, there's a real sense of community in terms of um, what it takes to survive as an artist. So I, I think that a lot of times the market, people love to talk about the market, and they love Basquiat because he sold a painting for $110 million, but he saw none of that. And he wouldn't have seen it if he was alive because the auction houses share none, none of those, those profits with the artists themselves. He was addicted to uh, cocaine and heroin, and and that's what he died from was speedballing, which was common. So you're, you're up and you're down, and you're trying to balance this, this seesaw, this, this kind of thing that you're on. And he had cleaned up. 
I saw him 10 days before he died. He said, I'm clean. I, I, I've been to Hawaii. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm going to Africa on Monday. And people came over, uh, friends, old friends came over that weekend. And his tolerance wasn't what it was you know, before he cleaned up. And so it really kind of grabbed him from behind. He, people say, well, did he have a death wish? No. No, he was dying to live. You know, he really wanted to live. He was, his, there was something heartbroken about him. Something broken. You know, it was, yeah. I think, because he was so smart. Yeah. And he realized he was a commodity. And there was some, there was some, he wanted to wiggle out of it somehow, I think. I, oh. I don't know if you had the No, thing, I think that's absolutely true. But I true. think he was heartbroken by find, realizing that he was this commodity that people were feeding off of. You know, there was a time, too, where he, when he started making a lot of money, he would go out and buy on buying sprees where he would, he would buy all, every piece of electronics that he could think of. And he brought it all home and he sat down and cried after he bought all this stuff. And, and to me, that was his, his confrontation with the idea that you can't buy happiness. You can't, you know, there's something that money will not fill. And so there was this sense of, again, ambivalence about his success. And, you know, it's when he started throwing people out of his studio and saying, not for sale, not for sale. And, you know, I saw him throw buckets of Kentucky Fried Chicken that people insultingly collectors, big rich collectors, would bring to his studio. We brought you some food. And, and he would get out, you know, and he would, going out, he would dump the food on their heads as they left. So there was this real anger and disdain for uh, the market that really kind of uh, cannibalized him. So it's it's a two-edged sword, but but he you you could sense this kind of uh, sadness in him too. I think there's a really big big hope going on. There's these kids, the spring break kids, uh, Andrew Gorey and Amber Kelly. They've been uh, doing uh, at the same time as the big um, uh, Armory show in early March. They do a show in some abandoned space in Manhattan. And it's grown and grown in the last seven or eight years. Uh, it started out at St. Patrick's uh, School that was closed. Then it was on the 34th Street Post Office, those abandoned floors above that. Felt just like the grandchild of the Times Square show. Last year, I think they had 150 curators and over 500 artists. And they were in the old Condé Nast floors off of Times Square. Um, you know, I think that there's a great hope in, again, community. and you know, kids getting together and creating a fair, an art fair, so they can hang out together with each other and they can show their art and they can talk to the public about their art. And um, I, I helped a, a little artist named Kelly Simone Waits last year and this year as well. And she's terribly shy, Brett's spoken with her and she was just so elated to get out of her studio, be in a space with other artists, talking to people coming in who were interested in, with, with her work. I mean, these are the thing. These are the, the these. This kind of thing is very encouraging. And yeah, I, I'm. Re, I'm very encouraged by young artists and younger people too, because uh, I have I have a really regular contact with them at the School of Visual Arts. But at the same time, you know, they are. Uh, creating an alternative culture, which is really important. I think it's always been about the academy or the establishment against independence. And this goes back through all of art history. And, and you look at, at how people have uh, dealt with this lockout. And, and so you kind of create your own culture. And this has been happening, you know, at least in America for generations that you have this kind of uh, exposed elite culture that really dominates everything and lock, it keeps other people from joining. So what do you do? You, you turn in you, to, the, to the person next to you and you say, you want to start a band? And, and the, yeah, I do. I do. Bill? Three words. Green, green new deal. Green new deal. All right. Affordability. Thank, thank you very much for everybody. coming tonight. That's